situation. He took a pinch in the back. He got beamed for crying out loud. We used heart attack. Please. Managers on a major league baseball team don't make decisions. The credibility in this situation is worse than losing your job. Was it over with it? Trevor's mom called Harmer? The castration of the major league baseball managers. We know it. Ask me about my win. Slurs, whether they're racial, homophobic, anti-Semitic, any other way you could slur an entire group of people, we understand has no place in our society. And very often you'll hear people, for whatever reason, say things that shouldn't be said. And then there's this separation between uh, um, somebody saying something that's vile and so somebody saying something that is against an entire group of people. And we have two examples that have happened really over the past handful of days where a broadcaster from the Oakland Athletics has said a racial slur on the air, perhaps unintentionally, but very vile in the way that it came about. And a coach of the West Virginia team, Bob Huggins, legendary coach, he's had a lot of success Cincinnati was talking about a rivalry and he basically lost his mind, you know, dropping F words, homophobic slurs during an interview. Are these two things separate? And here's the issue that I have, because I think depending on where your best interest is, if your race is going to be the backbone of everything you say, you're going to say that the Glenn Kuyper slur is a lot worse than the Bob Huggins slur. If you are homosexual, you're going to find that Bob Huggins slur is a lot worse than what you felt Glenn Kuyper's were. Now, I have stated before, and this has come up many different times on the show, I have no interest in cancel culture. I feel that there should be accountability for actions especially in Glenn Kuyper's case. And here's what I'm going to explain this why right now. You're looking at a person that is a professional. He's getting paid for his voice. He has the understanding of the vernacular and what needs to be said in a way that it needs to be said. So there should be no excuse for a, in his mind, a slip up on the air. Now, the background of what Glenn Kuyper said, he was talking about the Negro Leagues Museum, a visit that he just had with Dallas Braden, his fellow broadcaster. So all of that would point to no racial issue coming into until he said the word. Now, once, once you say the word, as a professional, if you're getting paid for your voice, you got to be responsible enough to be able to control whether you say that word or Negro Leagues Museum, which to me sounds pretty simple. I, I could pull that off fine, but Glenn Kuyper tend, you know, had, to, had to use the other word when describing it. So um, I, I don't really have any tolerance for that. Do I think he should be fired? I think the Athletics did the right thing, the Oakland Athletics, by suspending him indefinitely. Um, should the guy lose his job over it? Once again, I want to I want to hear probably a deeper apology, a deeper understanding of what it is that he said, whether it was intentional or not. The fact that as a professional, it cannot be communicated over the air in the way that he said it. And I want a commitment that he's going to be better going forward. This is something that, listen, there's people that aren't going to be able to forgive him for what he said. Even though the backdrop of it, there, there's nothing racially motivated behind it. He's complimenting the Negro Leagues Museum. He said the other word. While there's no excuse for it, there's also not the track record of this is a, a racist going on a rant. When Bob Huggins is going about, you know, you know, dropping F words, talking about homosexuals, there's obviously some tension and some issue that he has with the gay community. And he's got to do something about that. And if you listen to his apology, he feels embarrassed about it. Listen, that was a bad job on his part. 
Should West Virginia fire him? Once again, you know, the, the firing of people of high positions for these type of actions is doing nothing more than having a general public say good. And are you out there to appease people that in certain situations aren't making the right decisions themselves? There's no guarantee that John Q. Public, who's laughing and saying good when somebody in a, a position of power loses their job for something stupid, there, there's, no, there, there's no relief for that person. What I want to learn, because we're all creatures of God, we're all br brought in by God, I, I want to know that there is some remorse. Remorse is the first step for forgiveness. And I think each one of these people could use these actions as a springboard to become better human beings. So I wanted to drop in a couple lines about the, the basketball for the last couple days. Is there belief in the Los Angeles Lakers? Certainly uh, up three to one against the Golden State Warriors, the defending NBA champions it should put them in a, a, a more comfortable position. Obviously, Game 5 is going to be in Golden State, and if I was kind of looking into the future, I figure you'd probably see the best of the Warriors playing basketball. Then you got Denver and Phoenix. That series is knotted up. you got the incident of Nikola Jokic going into the crowd and uh, shoving uh, who seems to be the owner of the Phoenix Suns. He doesn't get suspended for the next game, so that's good. I mean, you, won't, you don't want the best player on the court suspended for something that had nothing to do with playing basketball. But at the same time, it brings to my attention the responsibility of people in the crowd. Now, listen, you're that close. Sometimes you're going to be right into the action. The action is going to come to you. And everybody that is on court side, especially during a prestigious NBA basketball game, is paying for those seats. Now, they might be there as a guest of somebody who paid for the seats, but the bottom line is those seats aren't cheap. And you, you can't just go out there and, and, and get those tickets for a couple bucks. So you're sitting along the court side of an NBA basketball game. There's some responsibilities that you have to conduct yourself a certain way. You, you've seen certain instances, whether it's Shannon Sharp going off on a, the Memphis Grizzlies or you know, Spike Lee and different type of, of people and their actions on along court side of an NBA court, there has to be accountability that's held towards them as well. Now, the Jokic situation, hey, listen, he was coming in off a of court. He got too close. He shoved the man who happened to be the owner of the Phoenix Suns. He deserves to have to pay a fine. Should he be suspended? Absolutely not. But I don't think that should take the precedence over what's happening on the on the court. You got one player that is better than anybody on that court. And I think Jokic is a better player than Kevin Durant, the two-time MVP. MVP has really proven to be the elite player in the National Basketball Association. I agree that Joel Embiid should have gotten the MVP, but Jokic was right there. This, this guy is basically, he's an entire team by himself, which puts Denver in a compromised position because it, it makes it very hard for other players to step up and become major contributors. And if you look at uh, Jamal Murray and a couple of the other players there, they have their moments, but it's very hard to be able to help somebody that is such an integral figure on the basketball court. Chris Paul is out for Phoenix. You look at Booker and Durant, I think from a depth standpoint, the Phoenix Suns uh, have the best ability to put this together. But at the same time, they have to do something to be able to neutralize the beast because Jokic by himself is, is basically taking the entire team on. Phoenix had a good win the other day. It's going to be interesting. I like Phoenix as a team better, but I'm... Curious to see how far Nikola Jokic could take this team literally on his own back. So today, as we talk about saving sports history, brought to you by the Passball Show, JohnPielli.com, the whole thing, on the ninth day of May in sports history, 2010, Dallas Brayton, who is the broadcast partner of the right now disgraced 
Glenn Kuyper through the 19th perfect game in the history of Major League Baseball on this day 13 years ago. Now, I've contended that there may not ever be another perfect game thrown in the history of baseball. Could there be a combined one and we'll have to debate it and dispute it whether or not it holds the same type of ground? That could happen, but Dallas Braden's one of the 23. And that happened on this day in 2010. Births on this day, Harry Varden was born on this day in 1870, a six-time British Open champion and the 1900 U.S. Open champion. Women's professional golfer Betty Jamison was born on this day in 1919. She won the U.S. Open in 1947 and the Western Open in 1942 and again in 1954. So 12 years apart, she won the same tournament. Ron Papa Jack Jackson was born on this day in 1953. Papa Jack is uh, in a picture there with me. He was a guest on a past ball show, an incredible dude. Was also the hitting coach of the Boston Red Sox when they won the World Series in 2004. Hall of Fame outfielder and Mr. Padre himself, Tony Gwynn, was born on this day in 1960. And I've contended for years that this is one of the more underrated offensive position players to ever play baseball. He was a human hit machine. He, he didn't go out there looking for walks. He went out there. He put the ball where it was pitched. And hit 338 over the course of his career. And what stands out about that, because there's a lot of non-baseball fans or there's a lot of, I don't know, fair weather baseball fans that may not understand what a 338 batting average for your career stands for. Nobody has come close to that since Tony Gwynn retired. His batting average when he retired in, what was it, 2001, was the highest from a player since... Ted Williams retired in 1960. So you're talking about 41 years of baseball that nobody had retired with a higher batting average than Tony Gwynn's 338 in 2001 since Ted Williams in 1960. The day and age that we live in now where we talk about OPS, we talk about on-base percentage, we talk about slugging percentage. Yes, Tony Gwynn didn't draw a lot of walks. Yes, Tony Gwynn did not hit a ton of home runs, but he was one of the best hitters that the game has ever seen. Stanley Cup champion and longtime Detroit Red Wings forward, Steve Eiserman was born on this day in 1965, former NBA guard and now assistant coach Doug Christie was born on this day in 1970. Um, Brandon Webb, Former Arizona Diamondbacks pitcher Cy Young Award winner was born on this day in 1979. And you look at him really over a four-year stretch. He was probably the best pitcher in baseball. Unfortunately, his arm just went. One of those sad stories that you, you got to ride him for the, the years that he was really dominant. And he had the Cy Young Award se season, finished second in the Cy Young voting, I think two years in a row. Won 20 games in his last full season as a major league pitcher. 1984, Prince Fielder was born. And what stands out about Prince Fielder and doesn't get spoken about too much was his durability over the course of his career. His entire career with the Milwaukee Brewers, he basically never missed a game. His two years with the Detroit Tigers played in all 162 games. And then ends up with the with the um, Texas Rangers where he ends up finishing his career and sadly gets hurt, plays 150 something games and then ends up retiring, but very durable player for the time he played until his body finally gave out on him. The 319 home runs he hit in his career was the exact same amount that his father Cecil finished his career with. Jake Long was born on his day in 1985 the former Miami Dolphin offensive lineman, no relation to Hall of Famer Howie Long, but he was the number one overall pick by the Miami Dolphins in 2008. He was a three-time Pro Bowler, um, All-Pro, I think, one year, All-Pro second team another year. was pretty good for a little while. In 1915, we lost Anthony Wilding, and he was the 1910, 1911, 1912, and 1913 Wimbledon tennis champion. He was killed in action on the Western Front during the beginning of World War I. Also on that same day, 
Francois Faber was killed in action. He was the Tour of the Tour de France champion in 1909. He was killed in action on that same day in 1915. Graham McNamara, I'm sorry, Graham McNamee was one of the original sportscasters, one of the original play-by-play -play announcers as TV started to become prominent. He passed away on this day in 1942. He is a Ford C. Frick Award winner in the Baseball Hall of Fame, as well as the broadcaster to do the first ever Rose Bowl. 1997, Bob Devaney, the Nebraska head football coach who won the national championship in 1970 and 1971, passed away on this day. And Dan DeMine, the former Notre Dame head coach, passed away on this day in 2002. And we'll close the show with a little bit about Chuck Daly. Chuck Daly passed away on this day 14 years ago in 2009. The dominant head basketball coach of the Detroit Pistons, the bad boys, the whole thing, multi-time NBA champion. May he rest in peace. This is the Passball Show brought to you by JohnPaley.com, by St. Aloysius Church in Jackson, New Jersey, by two ways. One passion food truck located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. For those that are interested in hearing me flap my yacht mouth a little bit more, you can check out the Passball Show on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, and of course, videos on YouTube. We'll be back with you soon. God bless you. And as always, I'll see you on the other side. Chris Bryant was on the Chicago Cubs roster opening day. I have many leather-bound books. My apartment smells of rich mahogany. Why don't you give it all or a majority of it to the team that wins the freaking World Series? I was going to listen to that, but then I just carried on. I may come out as the biggest major league baseball manager apologist. That'll only make someone work just hard enough not to get fired. Because hitters are going out there saying, I'm either going to hit a home run or I'm going to strike out. And if I don't get a pitch that I feel like I could drive out of the park. I was supposed to be here today. Especially prospect whores and hoarders are going to be a little pissed off at me when I say this. I'm a dude who lay in the dude disguises another dude. There are only two managers in baseball's Hall of Fame who have losing records. One of them is the iconic Tony Mack, who you could say, in spite of winning five World Series championships as a manager, could be in as much as a pioneer. And what side of the spectrum they're on? Were they pitching? Were they batting? If your favorite team was pitching and a ball got inside and hit a batter, there's no way it could have been on purpose. But if, if you were a fan of the team that was batting and a ball got inside and hit somebody or went behind somebody's head, absolutely 100%, unequivocally, that pitcher was throwing at them. They put their tail between their legs and decided they're going to do exactly what they're told. You damn well right better give him a contract extension. You damn well right better make him the manager over the next series of years. 35 years ago, I could have loaned your parents the money for an abortion.